question. I, I mean, the underlying reason is that Russia is running very short. The numbers are that even after doubling its shell production from about a million shells a year to two million shells a year, Russia is still firing about 10 million shells a year in Ukraine. So it's only supplying one fifth and it's running very short. The uh, leader of North Korea and the Russian president have met at a cosmodrome in the far east of Russia. They have both spoken in public rather positively about their meeting, not surprisingly, with Vladimir Putin saying there are possibilities for military cooperation between the countries and Kim Jong-un saying we'll always support the decisions of President Putin. Well, earlier I talked to John Everard, who had been Britain's ambassador to North Korea between 2006 and 2008, and he told us a little bit about the relationship between North Korea and Russia in the recent past. Of late, really not that close. There hasn't been a lot of substance in the relationship. Lots and lots of warm words uh, and uh, occasional sort of high-level hugs. But, I mean, remember that even at high-level uh, summit uh, times. Uh, in 2019, the last time that, that uh, Kim and Putin met, Putin turned up shamefully late, uh, kept Kim standing around uh, because he wanted to go look at a forest fire, it turns out, which didn't go down well with the North Koreans. So uh, there's a certain amount of, you know, friction in the relationship. But there's clearly a wish on both sides to, to, to develop a, a warmer relationship and to see what they can get from each other. But isn't it a mark of, well, you tell me, desperation on Putin's part that he's prepared to do a deal with this regime and, and this man? Well, yes. Uh, and this is going to look really quite strange in Russia. I mean, it, for most Russians, North Korea is a kind of joke country. And there's their president uh, shaking hands with, with Kim Jong-un and taking him seriously. There's another angle to this. Remember that uh, Putin has just come from the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok, uh, which is a, usually a big shindig. It's where Russia shows that it matters on the world stage and invited all the, the local regional heads of government. This year, Almost nobody came. The highest level representation was a vice president of Laos. So I think part of this is Putin showing that he can talk to other national leaders, even if it's only Kim Jong-un. So what do we know about what's been achieved by their talks? Not a great deal. Uh, we know Kim has now left. He's on his way back in his great lumbering armoured train. Uh, but there's been no statement out of the talks that has yet been published. The Russians... Uh, uh, earlier today said that they were talking to the North Koreans about satellite technology, the space uh, program. Uh, remember that North Korea has so far had two failed attempts at putting a satellite in orbit, and it may be that the Russians have agreed to help them out a bit with that. But that's pretty thin rule. We don't know what, if anything, was agreed in terms of wider military cooperation. As you know, there's been a lot of speculation that North Korea might agree to supply Russia with shells. And we don't know anything about uh, the possibility of Russia supplying North Korea with grain, with oil, uh, supplies that North Korea desperately needs. We may get a statement out in the next couple of days. Why would Russia be prepared to take, let's say, ammunition from North Korea? Is it is it ammunition worth having? Big question. I mean, the underlying reason is that Russia is running very short. The numbers are that even after doubling its shell production from about a million shells a year to two million shells a year, Russia is still firing about 10 million shells a year in Ukraine. So it's only supplying one fifth and it's running very short. There aren't that many currencies around with stockpiles of shells that will fit Russian guns. Uh, and North Korea is one of them. North Korea has stockpiled shells just in case it ever had to go to war with South Korea or the United States or whoever it decides to pick a fight with. The big problem with North Korean shells is quality. Uh, if you keep a shell for any length of time, you have to give it a bit of love and care. And in particular, you need to look after the shell's fuse, otherwise they go and the shell won't explode. And you can bet your bottom dollar that in a completely corrupt country like North Korea, uh, that the money allocated for that TLC has been stolen and that a lot of those shells are duds. The Russians must know that, which, if you like, is a matter of their desperation. And what does North Korea uh, believe it's going to gain from this new cozying up to Russia in terms of its previous relatively cosy relationship with China? 
it, it's quite clear that North Korea had huge expectations of this meeting. Kim went accompanied by the head of his Navy, the head of his Air Force, uh, his minister in charge of munitions production. I mean, these guys were clearly hoping for Russian technology, Russian aid of all kinds. Uh, we don't know how far that's been satisfied. In terms of his relationship with China, it was really quite surprising, I think, that Kim felt the need to say that from now on, uh, North Korea's number one priority is developing its relationship with Russia. That was poking China in the eye, which is generally not a great idea. And after all the money that the China has poured into North Korea, all the help that Russia has, that's right, that China has given, uh, the Chinese may be feeling just a little bit put out. The Chinese reaction, uh, very low key, just saying that this was a question of uh, North Korean Russian relations effectively referring to comment. In Chinese diplomatic terms, that was stony faced. The, Rus the, the, the Chinese are being really quite unamused about this. And South Korea? What, what are the people and the government of South Korea to make of this? South Korea won't like any kind of warming up of North Korea's relationships with Russia. Uh, South Korea worries every time that North Korea acquires uh, new technology. And although it's not clear what technology, if any, Russia is prepared to transfer as part of a deal, uh, any transfer is bad news for South Korea. But there's another angle to this. Some people here in Seoul are saying that actually one of the main drivers for this meeting was a warning to South Korea by Russia. You see, South Korea has one of the world's most developed, most efficient arms industries. And there have been lots of calls for South Korea to supply arms and munitions directly to Ukraine. It's shied back from doing so, so far, although it has supplied a lot of munitions to Poland, uh, which has then released Polish munitions to go to Ukraine. So a kind of triangular arrangement, if you like. Uh, but it, the Russians are clearly worried that the South Koreans might in future change this policy. And the theory here is that this was a warning. If you start applying shells to Ukraine, we will give the North Koreans technology. Maybe. It doesn't, uh, to be blunt about it, and without putting um, the fear of God into everybody listening, it doesn't really bode well, does it? Any any sort of warming of the relationship between, let's be honest, two really horrific regimes cannot be good news for anybody. Uh, it's certainly not the good news for the West. It's certainly not good news for South Korea or, for that matter, for Japan. Uh, but... I think we need to put a bit of context on this. Uh, although there's a lot that Russia can give North Korea long term, I mean, Russia has grain and oil that North Korea desperately needs, and it's got technology that North Korea would love to get its hands on. Once North Korea has handed over quantities of this, these rather dubious shells uh, to Russia, uh, even if it's prepared to do so, that would, cause, would mean depleting its own stockpiles. Uh, there's not a whole lot that North Korea can give back. So we may well find that after all this razzmatazz and all this talking up of the relationship, that things just peter out quietly in a few months' time. There may be less to this than meets the eye. Let's hope there is, actually. That's John Everard, who had been Britain's ambassador to North Korea between 2006 and 2008. Uh